Hi guys, I'm Safa of Lesbos, and today we're going to... I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do this. This takes way more smiling than I'm physically capable of. Um, let's... <sighs> Much better. So I have this masochistic streak where I watch Christian traditionalists on YouTube. I'm Jewish. I swear. And there's just one channel I keep coming back to. They're called Girl Defined. They're a advice channel that focuses mostly on Christian femininity. And they're just easy to watch. I mean, look at these production values. We see in our culture the value mm -hmm. that they place on outward beauty. We see it everywhere we go. And as a result, we deep in our hearts, without even knowing it, really do start to believe that gorgeous girls really are worth mm -hmm. more. That this certain standard, if we can only measure up to it, that we would be happier. We buy into this and believe that if only we were physically more attractive, then we truly would be worth more. I mean, listen to that audio and the lighting and the makeup and that nice clean set complete with twinkly lights. I mean, they don't hold a candle to my vintage Nancy Drew collection. Huh? Huh? Just, just roll the next clip. Being a girl in today's culture can be a really confusing thing. We're getting mixed messages all over the place. You need to have long hair. You need to have short hair. You need to weigh this much. You must have a boyfriend. You must pursue a career. You should be independent. You should get married. You shouldn't get married. Beauty is based on how you look. Just follow your heart. There's seriously no difference between guys and girls. Seem confusing? That's because it is. Yeah, it is really confusing being a woman. Next tough question that we're going to use the Bible to answer is the topic of creation, right? Where did we come from? Where did the world come from? How did all of this stuff get here? Very relevant. <laughs> if you're in high school, in college, you're probably being taught the most popular theory out there, which is the theory of evolution, the Big Bang Theory. That's what's popular. That's what scientists are telling us. Oh, we're finding new research. This is what yeah. we all need to believe. But as Christians, we need to say, okay, that's interesting, but what does God's yeah. word say? What does God's word tell me about creation, about where the world came from? When we open up our Bibles, we can find a very clear, an clear answer to this question. We turn to the very first book in the entire Bible, very Genesis funny. 1, and it clearly states the first verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the... Oh no. The pill weakened our nation's value of babies, which in turn became the perfect platform for legalizing abortion. While in many movies, the lead couple does not end up together, La La Land has a startling and inaccurate account of sexual immorality. At its root, feminism is built upon a foundation completely devoid of God. Feminism has never offered a solution that the Bible hasn't already taken care of. In Genesis 2, we see that God created a male and a female, two distinct genders, two equally valuable, purposefully different genders, but they were very distinct. It was a man and it was a woman. And when we go back, we realize, you know, this topic of gender isn't really all that confusing. If we let the Bible inform our worldview, we God is very clear on this issue. It's not as confusing as the culture is making it seem. It's very clear. One man, one woman, we need to embrace the gender that God gave us and not let our feelings determine where we're going to go. We have to look at scripture and say, yes, God designed a male and a female, and I am going to believe that that's what's best for me, and that as my creator, he knows what's best for me, and I'm going to embrace that. Girl Defined appears benign. Oh, that rhymed. Which is probably why the only person to currently have a video against them is this guy. Oh God, if you do exist, please don't let these kilfs go on a tirade about how society is turning women into sluts. I mean, guys, we like our sluts. I have joined the ranks of the edgy atheists. To give some credit to the angry atheist, although his name is hardly original, his is probably the douchiest explanation I have ever heard for how a woman is allowed to dress however she wants. 
Nine times out of ten, their advice is good. Common sense, even. Take, for example, their video about guys you shouldn't date. They list guys with anger issues, guys who pressure you, and even guys who want you to solve all their problems. They tell women not to settle or base their worth on physical beauty. They tell girls not to be obsessed with guys. But I read their book. And it's only once you start looking at the subtext that you get their real meaning, and that's where the danger is. Outwardly, it seems as though Girl Defined isn't advocating for women to be subservient. In their section about how women should be helpers, they have two block quotes from two different books about how helper doesn't mean lesser. But ultimately, in the same section, they talk about how Adam and Eve are opposites, and Adam was made the leader, and Eve the helper. This theme continues throughout the book. Like, there's a section about femininity and love, and there's a subheading called Scoot Over and Let Him Lead. And in that section, there's a block quote, which describes a relationship between a man and woman where the woman took the lead from the start. And now she complains that her husband is wimpy, whiny, and disgusting. That is a direct quote. In the section calling out the hero in your man, the first subheader is encourage his leadership. And again, with the benign rhetoric, it says, if you're interested in dating someone, wait for him to ask you out. Wait for him to make his own moves. In any relationship, ask him what he thinks and listen. Allow him to make decisions in the relationship. Ask for his advice on big and small things. Affirm him when he makes a good decision, even if it's a simple one. Again, it's good advice, but it begs the question, what's the man supposed to do? Is it the same thing? I mean, I should hope that the man in the relationship is also asking advice of the women. But men and women have opposite roles in a relationship, so is the woman the only one who's supposed to be asking for advice? Throughout the book, there's just a pervasive idea that the man is the one who's supposed to be in control of the relationship. Which, although not outright saying that the woman is subservient, is pretty damn close. In the same vein, there's an idea that's throughout the book about how a woman's role isn't confined to the home. Like, there's a section telling the stories of different Christian women. Some married, some not married, some with children, some without children. Clearly, it's supposed to give you this idea that biblical womanhood isn't about being barefoot and pregnant, which it isn't. In this section is the story of Ashley, a college graduate who decides not to go to law school because it would interfere with her dreams of being a wife and mother. Okay, fair. She's allowed to choose motherhood. It's her choice. The problem is, the idea of grad school being a bad idea isn't just confined to her anecdote. It also appears in the story of Lindsay a few chapters later, in which a woman makes the wrong choice and goes to grad school, and now, after having children and deciding that motherhood is for her, can't stay home with the kids because of her unpayable amounts of student debt. The book pushes this idea that if you go to grad school, you will ultimately regret it once you're married with children because you'll want to choose motherhood over any career the world can offer you. Which just isn't true of every woman. And their idea of careers women can seek outside the home is also quite limited. It's usually either ministry or a family business because, after all, your work should glorify God, and nothing glorifies God more than helping your husband or father. They believe that women who don't dress modestly don't respect their bodies. They think just because God made Adam and Eve, no one is ever trans. And there's a section in their book where they talk about some pretty basic concerns or reservations about biblical femininity, and they refer to it as the devil tempting you. I don't know, maybe I'm just a massive Jew, but shouldn't your ideology stand up to even basic scrutiny? 
These ideas are couched in the language of female empowerment, but their ideology opposes the pillars of counterfeit femininity, which are independence, liberation, and sexual freedom. And like, that isn't my take, that's literally what they call the pillars of counterfeit femininity. And don't get me wrong, I don't have a problem with women who don't want to have sex before marriage, or people who, who emulate more traditional gender norms in their relationships. I have a problem when this ideology is presented as being in opposition to liberation or freedom, and is presented as the only solution to today's problems. Girl Defined might seem benign, but the ideology they promote is insidious. Their ideology is one of female subjugation presented as female empowerment, which frankly scares me because I don't want to be living in a society where women have handed over their freedoms to the point where we're living in the Republic of Gilead.